Hey, Fed Heads, welcome to another episode of Sharing Our Pairings, episode 29, Dram Cask number three, Cigar Pairing with Whiskey. I'm your host, Cigar Surgeon, broadcasting live around the world, and if you're so fortunate listening to an iTunes podcast or one of the other fancy phones like Android or whatever, but all you guys seem to prefer iTunes, and that's cool with us, I'm here as always with our co-host, Robbie Rass. Rob, what is going on, brother? Um, nothing. You know, living the dream. I'm, uh... Ashen on my keyboard and uh, getting ready to hop on a plane tonight, fly to Miami and spend the day out there and then head down to Nicaragua for the Cigar Federation Cigar Safari. So that's going to be fun. Nicaragua. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting into my pre-travel funk. <laughs> pre-travel I, funk, well. I don't know why. I, I get like in a little, I don't know, I get kind of in just like a little bit of tense. a funk and then I get tense and nervous. I don't know why. I I don't mind flying. I, I'm, I'm very comfortable on an airplane. I don't like landing. The landing is the part that I don't like, but uh, I like it when it's over. <clears throat> maybe maybe we should have done like two minutes pre-show of uh, or 20 minutes pre-show of just some Espanol, you know, just doing some some general uh, conversational yeah, stuff. Brush, in the brush up on my language. No, that's why uh, that's why the uh, the this, uh, Drew Estate guys are there. They they get to translate everything. I, I just I'm just along for the ride. And the and the and the smokes and the, and the smokes. beers, yeah, and the and the rum, yeah. But enough about us, because uh, if you're paying attention, you see we've got a third face on, which is uh, sometimes unusual for sharing our pairings. But uh, this is a special guest, Joe Cusano. Hopefully, I've said that right. Of uh, Dram Cigars, Joe. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure, guys. I'm glad I could be here. We're pretty glad too, because um, we're enjoying uh, Dram Cask Number Three, which uh, is right up my alley. It's uh, spicy, smoky, medium plus. I mean, you're uh, you're kind of hitting every single mark with uh, spicy, smoky. I don't know if uh, that Rob kind of goes towards the creamy end of the spectrum, but this is like right in my wheelhouse. Ah, I'm glad, Dram. We really paired each blend to go with a specific taste profile of a whiskey. So even though the cigars are great on their own, when you have them with the whiskey, it really enhances both experiences. Now the three, I take your time on the three, roll it around, taste a little bit of an espresso, a little spice, some dried fruit, little black cherry, blackstrap molasses. Is that can you? I'm, I'm definitely getting that dried fruit. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely getting the dried fruit in there. And what are you guys gonna pair that with tonight? Oh, we've got a few different things. Uh, as as John mentioned, uh, he, he alluded to uh, these are all John's whiskeys. He uh, he's nice enough to, <laughs> to hook me up with some samples here because uh, his his whiskey library is actually a library, and mine's just like a, a small shelf. Um, so I'm going with the Abalor. Uh, John, you're gonna have to help me with this again. It's it's Gaelic, but to the best of my non-existent Gaelic, it's Abuna. Uh, Avalor Abana, okay, and uh, uh, Amrut Sherry uh, Sherry Cask, right? That's right. The Amrut is uh, an Indian single malt whiskey, which is a pretty unusual thing in the industry, but um, really fit the bill when Joe is describing sort of what the uh, predominant uh, f uh, liquor that they're looking to pair with. Um, spicy, smoky, and I mean that Amrut is uh, it's a heater. Yeah. Well, you stumped me on your two whiskeys too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's this is my two, John. I think you're going something a little more mainstream than I am, yeah. Yeah, I am. So straight off the uh, Dram Cigars website, DramCigars.com, the McCollin 12 Sherry Oak. This is um, one of my favorite whiskeys. Uh, I know it's only a 12 year for some of you whiskey snobs out there, but this is kind of the whiskey that started it all for me. Uh, I have gone through more balls of this than I care to admit live online because someone might think I have a problem. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a phenomenal dram for the for the 12 year uh, and for the money. If you can find it, pick up every bottle you can because they're not going to be around pretty much at all. And then, because uh, I know you had the Angel's Envy on there, and I don't have any Angel's Envy. I wish I did. But <clears throat> the Knob Creek Straight 9 year, and this is, uh, man, this is so good. We've had this on the show before. We did a bourbon show, and uh, man, it's a, it's a little peppery, spicy here, and... Uh, Kind of seem to fit the bill based on the description on the website. Oh, yeah. The three will go great with the Knob Creek and the McAllen 12. Two good choices to, to really taste where that cigar is supposed to, supposed to be. So, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm looking at this, and Bullet is right there in the middle. I should go get some. I have Bullet in the bar. 
Yeah, both, uh, I'm a bourbon guy almost as much as a scotch guy. So the bullet, the nub, there, I love a good bourbon, and mm -hmm. the three is the bourbon cigar. Hmm. Nice. We, uh, we'll drink anything here on Sharing Our Pairings, but I'd say we're pretty <laughs> partial to our bourbons and whiskeys, which, you know, bourbon is whiskey, but uh, whiskey's kind of a broad term. Um, yes. You know, whatever. Pour it in my glass. As long as it's a brown liquor, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> well, you, if you look at the top, if, have you guys, can you, can I try to show this little chart here? I don't know if it'll actually show up on the camera. Yep. This is the chart we have in the stores, and it kind of gives you an easy point of reference on which blend will pair best with which flavor profile of whiskey. And if you look up there, those weren't all the whiskeys we drank. Those were the ones where we thought people would recognize the names. So uh, somebody had to drink all those and smoke all the cigars. And tough job. A, oh, That's a tough, and tough job. Somebody had to do it. <laughs> In the name of science, someone had to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> So, Joe, we, we kind of talked about it in the last show, but um, when we're sort of revisiting the uh, the blend for the cigar for this show, I happen to notice, uh, just as a reminder, that it seems that every blend has a double binder. Is that right? That is correct. Every blend is a double binder, and we did that to hit the taste profile we needed. We needed to get that extra little bit in whatever taste profile it was, and we hit that with the binder. The filler blends, again, are all different. The wrappers are all different. And what we found was that the double binder gave us the most intense flavors that we were looking for. And double binder, you could say double wrapper, but it's a double binder is what we call it. Now, have you guys tried all four, uh, the, the other thing, anything else other than the two yet? We, this, yeah, this is the third show. We've done one, two, and three. One, two, and three. Perfect. Perfect. You know the one is, the one is great with a milder whiskey. I I don't know how you guys rated it. I'm sorry I didn't get to take a look at it, but it's one of my favorites for a really mild whiskey. I was a big fan of yeah. uh, of Duran Number One, and I, John, if I remember correctly, you were too. And I'm trying to remember what I paired with that day. I know I paired it with some Glen Morangy, um, because that was one of the few things that I actually had in my <laughs> in there. And it's that the pairing was perfect. I. I what else did we pair, John? Do you remember? Uh, I think you had the uh, might have had the Yamazaki, and then, uh, gosh, you know, I drink too much whiskey because I don't remember <laughs> either. But uh, I think you made a really good comment, Rob. And something we sort of touched on is that um, it's nice to have cigars that pair with things. But one of the things I think that really stood out for us, and certainly for Dram Cigar Number no. One, is that these are cigars that absolutely would stand on their own. That is. You're not losing anything by pairing them. You're certainly gaining a lot, but you could certainly enjoy one of these on their own, and, and, and they absolutely stand on their own. Oh, thank you. Well, that, that was one of the targets we had to hit. The cigar had to be really good on its own, and we spared no expense. We used the best tobaccos. We, we did the extra fermentations that we needed, and it, it, you just take a look, and I think we hit the target. And, uh, and actually how this whole thing first started was as a was as a response. A local whiskey festival had a person that was supposed to supply cigars for them and do a pairing class. Well, the, the whiskey festivals in the local town that I live in, uh, the cigar person backed out at the last minute, and he knew my phone number and knew I was a cigar guy. So he called within a, a two-day window. I had to get some cigars, get the whiskeys that they were going to be using, and come together with a pairing. And I brought out a Connecticut Shade because we had a very mild cigar, uh, very mild whiskey. And that one of the gentlemen in the audience didn't like Connecticut Shade. He said, listen, I'm not a Connecticut Shade guy. I really don't like it, so let me just pass on this one, and I'll just, I'll just try both whiskeys with the stronger cigar. Oh. I asked, please do me a favor. Just try it. I'll give you another one of the other cigars. Just try the cigar with the whiskey that we're going to try to pair together. Well, he looks at me again, lights a cigar reluctantly, takes a couple of puffs on the cigar, gets it lit, looks at me and says, it's Connecticut Shade. I don't like Connecticut Shade. I said, please just try the whiskey with it. So he <laughs> takes a little sip of the whiskey, takes another draw on the cigar, and he kind of just looks out of the corner of his eye at me. 
doesn't look directly, just a little bit out of the corner of his eye, does it again, turns his head and says, that's pretty good. I said, yeah, the, the proper cigar with the proper whiskey just enhances both experiences. And even if you're not a one wrapper fan, when you pair it with the right whiskey, the flavors are either complementary or contrast, but they taste better together. Yeah, I would, I would, I mean, we've obviously, this is our 29th show, and uh, we would absolutely echo that statement, and I think, you know, certainly one of the questions that I might have, and I'm sure that our audience has, is how long was it, the, the process in, in terms of each blend coming from start to finish? I mean, there's so many different uh, flavor combinations and pairing combinations. I mean, again, tough job, but it's it's a timely job, right? To find the right. I mean, blending a tobacco, blending a cigar on its own is extremely complicated. But to blend it with a particular type of beverage, you know, you just ramp up the complexity to the nth degree. It, it was. It was really. It took about about a year and a half just to get everything. And we had a starting point. I had an idea where I wanted to, to start from. And once we had that starting point, that was, you know, a quarter of the way through the process. And then to take that, what, what, what really increases our time also is that you can't just change a blend and smoke it right then. It has to age a little bit. So we were about a month between each one of the different, different blends coming about. So we, we multitasked. <laughs> <laughs> so once we had... Uh, once myself and a few other people out of the core group had the cigars that we wanted, we brought it out to a bunch of a bunch of folks that we know. We had an idea what taste profile that they were for tobacco and for cigars. So we said, okay, try this, try it with this whiskey, try it with that whiskey, and tell us where do you think the pairings come in. That's why you see there's a range depending on each on individual taste profiles. It's about 200 people that tried these. Well, that's a nice focus group to get you know, that many people to get feedback from. That's on, on a project at this scale. That's nice. Yeah, and you're giving free cigars and free food. <laughs> they were lining up. <laughs> yeah, it was, I'm sure they were tough to find. <laughs> no, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm about, I don't know, about an inch in on this number three. And this is, as John mentioned before, I'm much more of a... Uh, uh, a creamy cigar guy. I like that creamy profile with some sweetness there. I <clears throat> I do like uh, a spicy cigar. I have to be in the mood for it. And uh, I'll be I'll be completely frank and honest. I wasn't in the mood for it coming on to this show. I was like, oh man, we're gonna do the big spicy one. But it's fine, you know, because I'm in my pre-travel funk now. You have to remember that. Mm -hmm. So I was a little bit I was a little bit hesitant. But this this cigar is really good, and I can see this this would be really popular amongst the uh, Cigar Federation guys, the Fed heads out there that really, they, they like the spicy stuff. They like these cigars that, are, that fit this profile. And what I like is it doesn't have a ton of strength that's blowing you away for no, for no reason. Strength for the sake of strength has never been anything that really appeals to me. Um, but, and I've been cheating a little bit with my, uh, with the Avalor here and the, the pairing is really good. <laughs> <laughs> the, at the number three, with, with the binder we use there, it's a really, really thick binder. So it really has a nice, it's a heavier smoke you, than you normally get from a, from a Habana. When I say heavier, it's a little bit thicker in viscosity. Mm -hmm. And it really, it really helps with the, with the spiciness and the smokiness of the whiskeys. Just a reminder to audience, you're listening to Sharing Our Pairings, episode 29, live or via podcast, sponsored by Dram Cigars. You can check it out, dramcigars.com. We're here with special guest Joe Quisano of Dram Cigars. And uh, back to you, Joe. Um, quick question for you, because you came, you targeted this um, right before the IPCPR, which is fantastic timing, because that was just when uh, Rob and I were really getting into the heart of things for our show. We've kind of, I think we're on show nine or ten there. Um, can you talk a little bit, maybe, about because uh, you've got uh, Dramcast number four coming out, and I think it just yes. released. Is that right? Uh, Dramcast number four was just released. It it probably will hit the stores within a few within a week or two. It is. It came up in the container, and it is in our facility in uh, Florida. And the Dram four is a is a broadleaf Maduro. He. Sorry? 
It's going to be a heater. It's it's you'll get a little bit of coca, a little bit of caramel. It's got an earthy, smoky, woody with a little bit of a brown sugar tinge. Yeah, baby, that it's sounds good. Language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now we're talking. Now that's going to be one that you're going to want to pair with the, with the smoky stuff, the Lafroy or the uh, Petier whiskey. Yeah. yeah, and I think we've already got some stuff lined up for that show as well. I don't think we have a, a date set because we're waiting to get the samples in hand. But I know we've got the uh, we've got the whiskeys lined up, which I'm excited about that one too. <laughs> uh, we actually had a question here. I'm going to jump in. This one's from Bob Dog. Uh, just chimed in. He says, are, since we're talking about the four, it did just come out. We're a very ADD society. Uh, are there any uh, any plans to continue the line beyond number four? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. That's an unequivocal yes right there for uh, Bob's question. So <laughs> that, is that are we? Is that going to be something we're seeing? I mean, obviously four just came out. So you know, five, six, seven, thirteen, twenty-eight. That's all coming down the line. I wouldn't say twenty-eight. We're gonna. <laughs> So a bit aggressive. Special, some special blends come out. Hmm. The probably the next one you'll see will be a special blend we're working on right now. We have three that are in contention, and depending on which one, uh, which one I think we'll get the best product out of, that's the one we'll do. And I don't want to say any more because you may see some other stuff coming out of CNC cigars too. You know, Dram is one of CNC's portfolio. Mm -hmm. And CNC, we have the CNC Connecticut Trade, the Corojo, and the Maduro. But there's going to be another CNC line coming out too. It's going to be somewhere in between. It's going to be a little bit below the Dram, but above the CNC lines. Interesting. So it's, that's going to be a nice little experience too. But as for the Dram, the Dram, we're going to have some special casks come up which I'm really excited about, and I wish I could tell you, and it's killing me that I can. <laughs> well, uh, guys, we're going to have uh, Joe on uh, Cigar Chat coming up here uh, in June. Uh, actually, one month from today, June 11th, I think, is the date that we have set. So maybe we can get into a little bit more detail when uh, when that comes around. We can talk about some more of the CNC stuff. Um, but that'll be, uh, that'll be great. Looking forward to that, definitely. Thanks, me too. John, any, any uh, parting words of wisdom before we let uh, Joe go and we can jump into our pairings here? I think, uh, you know, as a huge fan of the Isla whiskey, well, whiskey in general, I'm really looking forward to uh, Dram Cask number four and obviously with the IPCPR right around the corner. I mean, we're only a couple months away. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys have in store for the IPCPR as well. Thanks, guys. Can't wait to see you there. Yeah, it'll be fun. You guys are going to have you're gonna have a popular booth, I would imagine, if you're going to have the, the cigars there and some pairing... Uh, some pairing ability there, maybe? Uh, we might have some behind the counter. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, oh unofficial wink, pairing. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Say no more, say no more. Got it. Got it. <clears throat> Thanks, guys. Great, Thanks Joe. So appreciate much, it. Joe. Appreciate it. We'll see you uh, in a month. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Joe. Take care. Take care, Joe. All right, so, John, you want to move on to these? Uh, I've already been in sneaking a few uh, nips here and there. Uh, of this Avalor. Avalor, is that how you say it? I keep, I feel Avalor, like I keep saying it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I've been sneaking some, and you, you, you warned me about this Avalor that uh, it was going to be a little bit spicy. Both of these are going to be spicy. And I did take a few sips beforehand, and you're right, it is, it is a, a spice monster for sure. Yeah. But when you pair it, I'm getting just a ton of sweetness out of it. Mm -hmm. When you pair it with this cigar, because the cigar is so spicy. And I don't know if, if you're going to be sipping on this Avalor tonight or not. Um, I wish. Uh, so you're not. I, it's too bad. I'd like to compare notes. But it's it's funny that I, it's bringing out such a sweet quality. But let's uh, we'll get into that, I guess, as we go. Yeah, I just want to quickly, because uh, I prompted up a Bob Dog question uh, just before we let Joe go there. And uh, Bob was asking, um, do we do we select the uh, pairing whiskeys based on the descriptions? And uh, I would say, Bob Dog, absolutely. Um if you go to dramcigars.com, it's actually a really helpful uh, resource if you're not sure what to pair with. And I think Bob Dog actually brought up an interesting point earlier in the day about uh, maybe pairing with a chai tea latte, which is kind of an interesting thought because a chai tea is, is kind of got that spicy uh, spiciness, but also some uh, some pepper and a little bit of cream on it. And that might be an interesting alternative for those who maybe aren't uh, drinkers or, or want to just try pairing with something else. Um yeah, absolutely. I went on the website. We looked at um, what the recommended pairing was. 
um, searched out some of the tasting descriptors of uh, some of the whiskeys that are out there. And I also, you know, knew off by heart because I do have a reasonably okay whiskey selection here that, you know, there are particular whiskeys that immediately jumped out at me. The uh, Aberlour was one of them. The uh, Amrit was uh, no question easy pick for me. So, uh, yeah, if, uh, if you're not sure what to go with, if uh, you don't trust our recommendations, trust Joe's recommendations, go to dramcigars.com, check it out. Uh, they really will steal you in the right direction. Yeah, for uh, the last time I was there uh, was, was just recently, so I don't know if they've changed their site. It's just the one page, just the mm -hmm. landing page. And it's basically the same little flyer that Joe was holding up with the, the, you know, the breakdown of the cigars. And, um, and they kind of rate everything from a citrus to a uh, smoky notes and everything in between. Um, for a one-page website, it's a, there's about as much information as you can get there without just going blind from copy. Uh, the mm -hmm. way that they did it, and I think I'm drawn to it a little bit more uh, because I'm more visual. I, I'd rather, you know, see pictures than words, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but it, there's a ton of information there. And it definitely gives you – it's a really good guideline for these these cigars in particular. Um, and, yeah, I'm looking at the at the ratings here, and they, they say they want to – you want a spicy or a smoky whiskey – and that bullet, and I really wish I would have grabbed it, is sitting right there on top of the spicy. And I love bullet. And it's funny. I don't really think of it as spicy. And I, My definitions of spicy for cigars and I guess spicy for everything else are two totally different things in my head. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I mean, when you talk about like a brown whiskey, something that is either um, a bourbon or a, or a sherried whiskey that has that peppery spice, it is different. Because when we talk about spice in a cigar – not necessarily a lot of sweetness that balances that out. You know, a lot of times you get a pepper bomb or a spice bomb. Um, you can occasionally get a spicy, creamy cigar. Um, but, you know, usually we talk about spice in a, in a cigar. We're talking about, you know, loads of spice. Whereas with a bourbon or a whiskey, um, there's other, there's a lot more um, flavor characteristics that can be thrown into the mix to balance that out. It's a little bit tougher with, with cigars, but uh, yeah, that bullet is uh, fantabulous. I like uh, Bob is he's online <clears throat> and he's chatting with us through uh, cigarfederation.com and uh, apparently Bob's motto is see whiskey drink whiskey. Hell yeah. <laughs> this, I, I like I, his I, motto. Yeah, I like that. And you know the more the this Abelor that I sip on, I'm getting out of my pre-travel funk. So this is good. It's lubricate. So, I'm getting lubricated if you will. Nice. So we'll talk a little <laughs> bit about the Abelor cuz um that is one of my favorites. It is cask number 37. Uh, what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> Aberlour does uh, single batch cask bottlings of their whiskeys. So what's good about that is you can get a unique experience with every bottling. What's bad about that is that if you find one you like, and that cask number 37 is one I really, really like, once it's gone, it's gone. They're not redoing it. That cask is not you know, magically being stored in the back of the warehouse for some secret release. Once it's gone, it's gone. So I've got 37, I've got 46. 46 is spicy, but in a different way. Um, the 46 is probably more up your alley. I don't think you can buy it anymore because that is also gone, but I'll probably bring some samples with me to the IPCPR. Um, it's more of the uh, citrusy, spicy, creamy, where the uh, Aberlour 36 is, is per, or, uh, 37 is predominantly uh, that really heavy, sherry, peppery spice, but... Um, even with that, you know, I, I think there is some, um, some melon fruit in there. Um, the, you know, there's a little bit of sweetness some some, um, almost toffee character, like, a, um, uh, I don't want to say burn toffee, but like that, that crispy, like on um, the outside of a creme brulee. Exactly. That this like the, the crystallized, uh, sugar. I know what you're talking about, but that, yeah. that doesn't really have the toffee flavor to it, but I, I know I, I, I think I get the idea of what you're talking about. And I just pulled up. Uh, my local BevMo has four bottles of the Abana. Uh, uh, is that how you say it? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what number it is. Interesting. It's just, it's, it just says Abana single malt whiskey, um, regularly 93 bucks. Club Bev is 79. Wow, it pays to be a member. Um, wow. <clears throat> but it doesn't uh, – I'm looking, I can see the bottle, but I don't, I don't see it's a number. Yeah. So you have to check it out. Cause <clears throat> I mean, it's probably in the fifties now, I think maybe even the sixties. Um, oh. yeah. Cause that 37 is, uh, almost two years old now and the 46 is I think a year old. Um, a little bit about Aberlour, the, uh, the distillery, uh, founded in 1879. They're a space side distillery actually located, I think pretty close to the McCollin. 
Uh, the interesting thing is, even though it was officially founded in 1879, their history goes back further than that. In fact, at least till 1826, they were they were doing uh, what at the time would have been considered illicit whiskey distilling. Nice. Uh, at least according to the uh, English government. Ooh. There are water sources, the uh, Ben Rennes Mountain. So it's, uh, it's a mountain fed spring, which means you're going to get really, really clear, uh, crisp water. And we've talked about that in previous shows. The water source is really the most important thing to start out that, that whiskey uh, process. Um, they have four stills, two wash, two spirits. So not a, not a ton, pretty standard. Uh, 3.5 million liters of production, uh, 792,000 freedom gallons per year. So average size distillery, not huge, not small. Um, now what's interesting is that a lot of their whiskeys are this sherry character. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we move on, but, um, sherry casks are becoming more and more expensive to get. Uh, I think the last time I checked, they're like seven times more expensive than a, uh, ex bourbon cask that you get out of the bourbon industry. So that is going to factor in, especially to Aberlour because they depend so heavily on sherry casks that we might see some different offerings from them in the near future. I don't think... Uh, and I don't know because it don't work for them, but I don't think they can keep on the current trajectory without changing th some things because the cost is going to keep going up. Sherry casks are in short supply. The uh, cask number 37 is cask strength. So it's a heater. It's 59.6%. 59.6%. Yeah, baby. That's why I'm getting so loosey-goosey. I mean, a bourbon, you drink a normal off-the-shelf whiskey scotch, you're drinking at 40 43%. So just think, you're getting 20% more alcohol per dram. That's that's a lot. I'm in. <clears throat> no, and I've, uh, you know, John is so uh, um, uh, so giving that he sends me little samples of these we talked about. <clears throat> Normally, like, for example, the, uh, the uh, uh, Amrut, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's it's still filled up to right about here, and I've already poured in my glass uh, for later in the show, and there's plenty in there. Uh, I've actually drained the entire Avalor. It's uh, I've I, I was sipping on it, and that's all that's left. So uh, it's I, everything that I've had from Avalor, I've really enjoyed. The, the twelve is great, just for its twelve year old standard style whiskey. Uh, my wife bought me a bottle of the four, fourteen or sixteen um, for Christmas. Love that. Uh, I think that th I think there's there's something about sherry casks that I really enjoy and just didn't realize it until just about right now. Yeah, I'm I'm a sherry whore. Uh, I mean, there's when I see a sherry cask whiskey, sherry finished whiskey, I go nuts. I just recently pick, picked up the uh, Springbank 17, which is a first fill sherry. I think I talked about that in the last show, but it's a first fill sherry. So I mean, it's just it's a sherry bomb, and I just I live for that. I mean, I drink everything. But uh, my wheelhouse is, is sherry and whiskeys. It always finds my happy place. Um, speaking of sherry, uh, I talked a little bit as we started the McCollin 12, which is a sherry oak. Um, now, McCollin, I'm sure everyone knows McCollin. They're probably one of the most recognized brands outside of Johnny Walker in the industry. Uh, they're founded in 1824. Uh, they are also a Speyside distillery, but they're labeled, they label their bottles a Highland malt which is true, Space Sides in the Highlands. Um, the original name when they started out was the uh, Elchies, Elkies Distillery. Um, that's what their name started with. And then they changed it in 1892 to McCollin Glenlivet. And I won't bore everyone with why Glenlivet was added to the end, but it's it's kind of a thing that everyone did to make themselves sound more uh, more cool. Uh, their water source is the uh, Ring Orm Burn. Um, they have a, a stupendous amount of stills. Uh, I think it's 24 plus. So nine wash stills, 18 spirit stills, which is just, it's crazy. And they produce a whopping 8 million liters or uh, 2.1 million freedom gallons per year, which puts them as, uh, you know, I think one of the top six, uh, distillers by production in Scotland. Now, uh, what's interesting is, um, and we'll talk a little bit about this because I've been avoiding this topic on all of our whiskey shows. Uh, the McCollin, unfortunately, because the demand worldwide for whiskey is so huge, even at 8 million liters per year, there's no way that they can keep up with production. And what we're seeing in the industry is more and more uh, distilleries can't keep up. They, they just, you, you know, you can't produce an 18, you can't produce a 21 year old. There's just, you can't stay, you can't keep on that, uh, hold that amount of uh, whiskey uh, in your, in your production without uh, selling it because it's just too expensive. There's too much demand. And, and, you know, you think about aging whiskey for 10 years, well, demand's outstripped it by three or four years down the road. 
So the McCullen ended up having to scrap their 10, 12, and 15 year um, bottles. You, if you can find them at a, at a uh, Bevmo or whatever, and you like them, pick them up because once they're sold, they're sold. They're not producing them anymore. They've been replaced with their, their core ranges now, the gold, amber, sienna, and ruby. They are no age statement. What does that mean? Well, if you've been paying attention to the previous shows, you know that no age statement simply means that they do not mark what the youngest whiskey is in that batch. So the youngest whiskey in that batch could be three years, but the oldest whiskey in that batch could be 30 years. It could be 25 years, could be 20 years. They simply don't disclose what that is gives them a little bit more freedom in, in mixing and matching what goes into that bottle. The downside is if you're a big fan of the, the core expression 10, 12, 15, well, unfortunately you're going to have to, you know, find something in the new gold, amber, sienna, ruby that you, that you like to replace it. Huh? <clears throat> That's uh, now I, I've, I've heard and I've seen people talking about in different stories. You see them online about how eventually the world's going to run out of whiskey because <clears throat> like you were saying, uh, demand is is outpacing um, the time it takes to make it. Is, do you think this is something that's going to be, and we're kind of getting off topic, but um, not. Uh, we're getting off half the topic because we're not really talking about cigars. But do um, you think this is going to be a trend? Mm, yes and no. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. Before, uh, I think it was the 1990s, no age statement whiskey uh, was the only kind of whiskey you'd really buy. I mean, you could occasionally buy an age statement whiskey, but, um, you know, still to this day, the number one selling whiskey in the world is Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker is a no age statement whiskey. It's, it's also a blended whiskey. So that means they take whiskeys from different distilleries and blend them together to make their final malt. But it's no age statement. There's no there's no year statement on there. And they outsell uh, age statement whiskey something like nine to one. So I think what you're going to see is, you know, we kind of shifted with the 90s and the 2000s and certainly the, the late 2010 plus. Um, we shifted away from uh, no age statement to age statement, at least in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, people people's preference, but still, if you look at the raw numbers, no age statement whiskey is still the number one selling whiskeys out there. So I think what you're going to see is more of a balance. You're going to see a lot of distilleries still offering their age statement whiskeys. Price is going to go up, but they're going to have an alternative as a no age statement whiskey, and it's just it's an economics thing. Um, some some distilleries are going to choose to only release to certain markets, and that's how they're going to limit what's available. So they'll still have age statement whiskeys, but other big distilleries, you know, who are interested in making some some serious cash, like the McCollin, they're going to have to release no age statement ranges to to be able to keep up with demand. It's almost akin to <clears throat> the way we talk about when the floodgates really open and, and uh, Cuban cigars are widely available in America, like what are they going to be able to keep up with the demand and things of that nature? It's a similar type topic. Absolutely. Um, interesting. No. So I, I do like the McAllen's, uh, the, the 12, uh, I, I enjoy the 12 a lot, which is what you're drinking. Um, <clears throat> so I might have to uh, snap up a bottle or two. If you can find it, absolutely grab it. Um, so the McCollin 12, what's interesting is that uh, the sherry on this isn't as um, spicy or, or it's not as much of a heater as the uh, Aberlour. It's certainly not as much as the Amaret. Um, what it is, is it's um, a little bit more sweeter. Finishes of dried fruit, so I get kind of a... Um, almost like a, like a plum raisin finish to it with a little bit of pepper and spice. Um, it's good. It pairs really well with a cigar. I think for uh, someone who's not maybe more advanced whiskey drinker, this is a great choice because the, uh, the McCollin 12 is not going to pull you over if you can find it. Um, and it does the, the sweet, um, sweet and dried fruit does a good job of um, sort of complementing the dram cask number three, which I think, for me, the McCollin brings out a little bit more of the smoky quality for cast number three. And I think that might, I, I'm, I'm going to find out when I move to the bourbon here, but I think some of that smoky quality in the cast number three might be drowned out by the uh, whiskey. If it was, uh, if it was more strong, if it's, you know, medium plus. <clears throat> Not to, uh, to rain on the, uh, the parade, but I just pulled up um, McCallan 12 at BevMo and at the, the Oakland store, which is right next to where my wife works, they have 106 bottles. So, Bye. yeah, <laughs> I'll take all of them, sir. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that it's, you know, having you, you say that and the, the 12 and the, the 15, I remember the 15 being quite tasty as well. Um, so I might have to uh, look into picking up a few bottles of those. 
Uh, they've got the 21 year old too. Oh, 25. It's only a thousand dollars a bottle. Um, sorry, moving on. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the experience that I'm having, we can, we can dial it back with this, the, the Al Albana, uh, 37, um, with the pairing with the cigar, I'm getting a ton of sweetness from, uh, from the Abelor. But there's that, there's still a lot of spice on the finish. There's a lot of spice. You know, when, you, when, when I take in a sip of anything that I'm drinking as far as uh, 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 adult beverages are concerned, I kind of let it roll around on my tongue for a little bit. And then, and then you take that, you, you, when you swallow it back and it hits the back of your tongue, that's really when I'm getting that spice. I mean, it really does have a pretty strong kick to it. So I think that if I was sipping this on its own, I'd want to put some water in there. I'd, and I haven't watered it down at all. Uh, I'd want to put some water in there, maybe even, you know, God forbid, an ice cube. Um, but uh, the the experience that I'm getting from this cigar is real, real pleasant. It's it's spicy, but it's not blowing me away. It's not uh, it's not a total spice bomb. There's extra yeah. flavor in there. There's some woody notes in there that I'm getting. I'm getting some nuttiness, and I don't know if that's coming from the cigar or the uh, or the Avalor or a combination of the two. And we'll, I'll, I'm curious to see if that continues when I move on to the Amrit. But uh, it's a really, really nice pairing. It's very earthy and it's very spicy. But if you go into it, and I mean, obviously, if you're going into a pairing like this, you know that you're going to get some earth, you're going to get some spice, um, and you're going to get that. I'm not getting a lot of smokiness um, that uh, I know you had mentioned that you're getting some of that. I'm not really getting much of that. Um, so there, that's, that's kind of an interesting dichotomy between the two. But um, the, the sweetness that I'm getting out of this Abelor is really, really amazing. Um, <clears throat> with the, the spice from the cigar. And I think what you're going to see <clears throat> specifically because it's a Spanish Oloroso and um, we've talked about this, some of the, you know, what type of Spanish uh, what, uh, sherry cask it is. Um, I think part of the reason that Aberlour has more spice to it, even though it could have the same cask as something else that isn't as spicy is because they tend to use a higher percentage of uh, Spanish, uh, the, the sherry finished, um, whiskey when they when they complete their um, their final product. So some companies might maybe only finish it for three months. Some maybe only use ten percent or twenty percent in the in you know because you're going to take some of the spirit, age some of the spirit, and then mix it with the original batch to get that final uh, concoction of what you're bottling. But you know, Abelur goes as high as fifty percent, which. Um, you know, if you're if you're taking fifty percent of that as uh, long term finished in a Spanish Oloroso, you're getting uh, a real uh, treat. I mean, it's it's extremely expensive to do that, but you're getting a ton of that uh, sherry character, and uh, that's why that's you know ranks as one of my favorite uh, bottles in my in my uh, cabinet. Yeah, I. <clears throat> it's so funny. We're sitting here. We do this show, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna buy a bottle of this, and I want to buy a bottle of this. No, I'm gonna get like <laughs> three or four bottles of Macallan 12 before it goes away. That's how um, it starts. Yeah, exactly. No kidding. It's I mean, believe me. I you should see my freaking pipe collection. I, and Logan Logan nailed it, man. He was like, you're gonna have a million pipes, and I'm gonna have all the pipe tobacco. And he's right. I mean, I've got. Although it didn't hurt that I won a couple of pipes on Instagram, like on back to back days, which was nice, uh, and never win anything. But I happened to win those two, which was funny. Um, and one of them I haven't even smoked out of yet. But, uh, yeah, this Abelor, man, I'm really going to start seeking out uh, some some sherry cask stuff. Because uh, it, now when you say that sherry casks are, are, are harder, to, harder to find, is it because there's less sherry being produced? I mean, do, do people really drink sherry? No, people don't drink sherry. And that's really the, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. That's what the issue is. If if everyone out there would go and drink sherry, please drink sherry, drink sherry. Our whiskey drinkers really need to drink sherry, but they aren't. Nobody's drinking sherry anymore. And as a result, there's not as many casks. And as a result, the cask cost goes up. So uh, some companies, uh, I'm not going to name any names, but some companies are resorting to literally filling a cask full of sherry, dumping the sherry, mm -hmm just to get that cask or maybe they're finding a way to game that cask um, to, to, you know, like maybe they're, they're cooking the cask a little bit to get some of that quality. Um, maybe they're using a cask two, three, four, five times just to eke whatever little bit of sherry is left in that cask because they, you know, you talk about the bourbon industry, man, you can buy as many casks from the bourbon, bourbon industry as you want. That's why yeah. uh, almost every single, um, Whiskey starts its life out starts its life out in a in an ex bourbon filled cask because they're plentiful and they're not that expensive. I think that's why you're probably seeing a lot of bourbon barrel aged stouts as well. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I, it's funny. I was at uh, I was at Costco today, and they had um, <clears throat> the the Costco that's local to me. And I don't know if this is a normal Costco thing. And I don't think you guys have Costco up there, do you? Absolutely. Oh, you do. Oh, interesting. Um, my Costco's got like this craft beer section, which they never had before. Nice. And so, I mean, I'm I go in there and I'm picking up you know some rogue double chocolate stouts and uh, and you know different things. And they had some Anderson Valley. Um, uh, bourbon barrel aged, and I think it was, I can't remember, it wasn't the wild turkey uh, bourbon barrel, which I've had before, it was a different one, uh, but they had them, and they were only like six bucks for the 22 ounce bottle, I, wow. almost bought, I almost bought like 10, and I didn't buy any, but, because um, <laughs> the beer fridge is full, man, the beer yep. fridge is, we're getting way off topic, but it is chock full, and uh, uh, the local BevMo had some belching beaver in stock, so, uh, and my, my wife loved the horchata, the belching beaver horchata, which is fantastic. So we got a bunch of those in the uh, the peanut butter milk stout. So there's no room in there. But um, anyway, I'll digress. This pairing is fantastic. I'm really enjoying the cigar. It's outside of my comfort zone, absolutely. Uh, and we both knew this coming in. Um, and I think that uh, the number four is going to squeeze a little bit more into my uh, comfort zone. It's funny. This is that portion of my my comfort zone that just it's not quite as as uh, extreme as the number four is based on the way that uh, uh, Joe was talking about the blend, but it just, it just ekes right outside because usually in cigars like this, I get a ton of pepper and nothing else, but that's not the case here. So I'm, I'm really enjoying it and I'm, I'm, I'm actually ready to move on to my next one. Absolutely. Before we do that, just a reminder to our audience, whether you're listening live on CigarFederation.com through the Cig Cigar Federation app, which I know you've downloaded, available for both Android and Apple. We are broadcast live around the world. Check out our YouTube channel. Please subscribe or check out our podcast available on your local podcast app, iTunes, Podbean. Uh, we are sharing our pairings, episode 29, and we're sponsored by Dram Cigars. They're available everywhere. I was checking out um, online, and uh, it's it's incredible. Most of the online suppliers have them. Uh, I think if your local B&M doesn't have them, please uh, ask them for them. If you're a big fan of pairing with uh, whiskeys or bourbons, uh, I think you know, you're know going to find a cigar that's right up your alley. Mm. Um, we were really uh, blown away by Dram, Dram Cask number one. I'm really enjoying Dram Cask number three. But as you say, it is time to move on to our next beverage. Yeah, the next uh, the next one I've got uh, cooking up here is, and I'm excited about it because it's a cherry as a sherry cask, and Hell yeah. which we've we've learned in the last few minutes is my favorite type of of uh, of whiskey. So uh, this is the Amrit uh, sherry cask, and John, give us some some info on this because I, I don't know anything about it. So they were kind of a surprise entry in uh, Dram Cask number two. Uh, maybe not the, the best pairing with Dram Cask number two, and I'm glad I sent it to you. I'd actually forgotten because it's so long ago. Um, but I think it's going to be the right fit for Dram Cask number three because it is a, a spicy pepper bomb. Um, it, it has some unique character. If you go back to uh, Dram Cask number, uh, Dram Cigars number two, sharing our pairings episode 28, uh, I went on at length about uh, this whiskey. Uh, it comes from uh, India comes from a big, big drink company, uh, Amrit. Um, they produce a ton of stuff. They, they kind of pr started producing a single malt whiskey just as a off, uh, a, an off uh, idea. Uh, but I think it's really taken off. It certainly uh, blew me away, and I'm you know not easily impressed by a lot of whiskeys. Um, I think one of the things that uh, is really impressive to me is that they use uh, local barley. Um, so the barley that you're uh, getting there is from India, grown locally. Um, and I think it adds some character to the whiskey that you wouldn't otherwise get if uh, if you were, you know, sourcing a Scottish barley or even a Canadian or American barley. Uh, it's a heater. It's 57.1%, so it's it's a monster. Um, uh, limited limited edition, so I don't know how long the run is going to last. The last time I was in my store, I st uh, my local store is here. I still saw it on the shelf, so it's still available, but it is a limited production run. So once they're sold through, they're sold through. I'd imagine they might do another run, um, or they might come up with something different. Um, but I'm looking forward to you trying it because uh, that sort of ends up being one of my uh, that's top top of my list for favorite sherry casks. It has <clears throat> that flavor that I'm now associating with <clears throat> sherry casks is it's almost like a cherry note that I'm getting on the end and yep. I, yeah and it's it, it's kind of a full jammy fruit note that's a little bit brighter jammy is not really the right word it's, it's like it's like fruit preserves it's yeah, a really exactly. Rich fruit preserve exactly but it's 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 
it's there's a little bit of tartness in there but not too much there's some sweetness in there but not too much it's a really well-rounded cherry flavor that you're getting on the end and this is definitely and again i'm you know already in a little bit here and i got the i'm almost you know more than halfway through my cigar so um the palate is a little bit uh overrun but i get a, a bright sweetness at the beginning that cherry note in there as well the finish has that spicy kick to it this is really really good yeah, it's like I said, it, uh, you know, I'm hesitant to keep drinking from the bottle because um, I'll have to replace it and I may end up just getting a second bottle before I'm done that, before they're uh, no longer available because, um, you know, like I said, it, it absolutely blew me away and it's it ranks as uh, certainly one of my top 10 bottles in my in my collection. Um, I'm drinking the uh, Knob Creek, which we had on our bourbon show and the uh, Knob Creek uh, blew me away. This stuff is so tasty. I've got my, uh, my fancy Canadian glass here it's just you got a little bit of ice in there because you know surgeon what are you doing putting ice in there baby it's bourbon i can do whatever i want with my bourbon <laughs> and uh it is 120 proof it is 60 percent abv i mean we are drinking some heater heater whiskeys tonight um other than the mccollin which is a 40 percent, everything else here is cask strength um and this knob creek even at 60 percent, which is i mean that is a monster it is smooth and easy drinking. Uh, you know, you got a lot of a lot of that caramel corn taste to it. Um, it's got a nice little spicy peppery finish, but it's not overpowering. It's just it's super balanced, and uh, I just want to drink the entire bottle here live in the show and just get gooned. I'd rather you didn't. Um, <clears throat> no, I've I've gone through my share of Knob Creek, and the way you described it is kind of perfect. It's exactly the 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 experience that I get every time. And it's one of those ones, it's one of those uh, bourbons that <clears throat> I take for granted, I guess, because, you know, for, for me, and I don't know if it's like this for everybody, but it's readily available. I can go to Safeway. I can go to yep. Lucky. I can go to my local little tiny little liquor store that's got, you know, they sell like little fifths of stuff that guys take out in paper bags, but I could still get that. And I can still, and I can get, you know, the big, the big handle bottle at Costco, you know, but it's really, really good stuff. And I feel the same way about Bullet. It's, it's good bourbon. And you can, I mean, we always have, uh, that's the Bullet happens to be our house bourbon that we have just kind of always have it. Um, but we're a little bit spoiled that we can just walk down to the store and find that, you know, without any issue. Uh, I'm I'm on the snob end of things with uh, drinking the stuff that John sent me, and I feel kind of bad because I'm drinking all the this great <laughs> stuff that you sent me, and and you're drinking Knob Creek. Not that it's not great, but you're drinking kind of the more readily available stuff when really it should be the other way around. So I do appreciate that. But um, yeah, Knob Creek is it's nails, man, and you can you can sip it straight. You can you know mix it up with some different things. You can make a nice little uh, a nice old fashioned out of that. You can make a nice Manhattan, which are two of my favorite cocktails. Um, I've Which been, reminds me, we need to do another cocktail show. Absolutely. I've been playing around. My wife and I have a, a, a blog that we're going to be starting here pretty soon uh, coming out, and I'll, I'll let everybody know once it's uh, once it's live. It's not quite live yet. Uh, but we've been playing around trying to make our own cocktails, and I came up with a little concoction uh, last week. It had some rosemary in it, and it was a bourbon-based cocktail, and it was actually really good. And I need. To, I hope I wrote down what was in it because <laughs> I kind of want to have it again, but I don't really remember exactly what I did. But I'm sure, knowing my wife, she made me make notes somewhere. I just need to find them. Now, one of the things to watch out for is I've been hearing through the uh, grapevine that <clears throat> some of the more aged bourbons might be disappearing because, again, uh, bourbon demand is through the roof. So. Huge. I've, I've heard that uh, there's some possibility Knob Creek might not be doing nine year anymore. They might be reducing it down to six year. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, and I don't know if the, the distillery would ever tell us that, but uh, I'm probably going to, uh, as soon as I've done this nine year, um, get another bottle and just sort of put it at the back of my cabinet to collect dust. Cause uh, I would be very, very sad if, uh, if I couldn't have this. Yeah. There's, there's certain things that, I mean, we're talking about these different Abelors, uh, that come out every few years and it's, you know, you get one, one bottle and then by the time you you realize you like it, it's already off the market and that stuff. I mean, it's the limited edition, just like cigars. It's the same thing. It has its place and it's great stuff, but the stuff that we, like I was saying, the stuff that we take for granted, if that all of a sudden disappears and oh man, what a bummer. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, you, you don't really think of, I, it's, I always, I always go back to the, uh, <clears throat> the four kicks meal kick. When I bought, I bought a box of those when they first came out and I smoked it and I liked it a little bit at the beginning. And then I smoked another, and I thought about buying another box cause I knew they were limited, but I just didn't realize how limited they were. 
And uh, I thought about buying another box because I had access to it. And I didn't because the second one I smoked, it was just too peppery for me. And then I waited six months and I smoked it and the cigar just blew me away. It was just so phenomenal. And I went back to buy it and everybody laughed at me like, yeah, right, dude, that's been sold out forever. So if you find something that you like, don't take for granted that you're always going to be able to find it. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Now, a little bit about uh, Knob Creek. Uh, they were started by Booker No after uh, Prohibition. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the flavor that had come out of Prohibition that people were searching was a little bit uh, more full-bodied bourbon, uh, something with pepper and uh, and some spice to it. Uh, they derive, Knob Creek is derived after a stream in Kentucky, which flows past uh, Abraham Lincoln's old childhood and home, which is kind of a cool little uh, historical nugget. Uh, the label... <laughs> Which is, I love historical nuggets. Uh, historical nugget. The, the label, which is uh, kind of interesting, is actually inspired from a tradition, a long-term tradition of uh, wrapping the finished bottles in newspaper. And that's how they, uh, that's how they were inspired to, uh, to do their bottle. Now, I'm, I'm actually looking at the bottle and realize that uh, the bottle is making a liar out of me because I said it was uh, 60% ABV, but the bottle actually says it's 50% ABV. So now I don't know who to trust because the website said 120 proof. So I'm going to go with the bottle, which says 50%. But uh, it is delicious. Um, and, uh, oh, the other thing, which is uh, unique um, for the bourbon industry, typically when you talk about uh, a bottle of bourbon, you're not just taking a cask of bourbon and putting it in a bottle. Um, and this is certainly true of whiskey, too. You don't just take a cask of whiskey and put it in a bottle. You've got a flavor that you are uh, trying to hit. So you have two, three, five, ten casks. And the distillery master, the malt master, takes those those whiskeys and he mixes them together to get that that product because they're looking for consistency of flavor now what's interesting about the knob creek and which part of what originally turned me on is that this is not blended from multiple barrels like normal this is a single barrel so you buy a knob creek nine right now and you buy a knob creek nine six six months from now you might get a completely different experience because they're two different barrels which i think is really cool no two bottles are going to be the same yeah, and it's, you can almost say that about cigars. <clears throat> you know, no two cigars are really the same. I mean, this, these are handmade products, and there's a lot of there's a lot of handmade uh, stuff happening when you're when you're uh, talking about bourbons and whiskeys. Um, when you got somebody behind the controls, it's you know it may not be hand rolled like the way a cigar is, but it's there's handmade things going into it. There's different you know the different casks and things are going to have different uh, <clears throat> different impacts on the flavor. So. Uh, that's one of the things I love about these two topics, and you know, I'm 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 excited because we've been doing a lot of bourbon lately, or not a lot of bourbon, a lot of whiskeys, and I love whiskey, and it's I'm reminded of how much I love it, and then after that, we're gonna go do some beers, and I'm reminded how much I love beer, and then we'll do some rum, and I'm reminded how much I love rum, and just how mad my liver is right now, like it's just. <laughs> He's just so mad. But you, uh, you want to talk about mad liver? So I spent the week in uh, Mexico. I don't know if you guys can tell I'm uh, slightly off shade of white now, um, but uh, I spent pretty much half the week doing pairings with uh, Cuban cigars, with Nicaraguan cigars, with Dominican cigars. Uh, and you know what? You know what was the the real winner of the week? No surprise, the Glenlivet Naduro, which I took a bottle down with me because I'm whiskey whore. Paired it with like six different Cuban cigars, three different Nicaraguan cigars. And you know what? Every single pairing was epic. It was just fantastic. That is like, that has now become my go-to pairing. Um, now, I haven't paired it with some some um, <clears throat> full plus cigars because I don't think it would go well. But uh, if you got anything up to a medium, even a medium plus, the Glenlivet Nadura is like, and, and I got to get a second bottle because uh, I drained the bottle I took down there. Uh, if you can get your hands on it, you like whiskey, that is a no-brainer that will go with just about anything. I think it would be a real winner with even the um, the Dramcast number three, even though the flavor profile is outside of the, the list. I think it would still go really well. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, you talk about the Nadura, and oh, that's always going to be the, the IPCPR 2014 official uh, official whiskey that we drank because I mean, we really did kill that bottle. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that that first guy was giving us those those pours, man. They were pretty solid. It was just it was just two fingers, you know. Yeah. Two, two finger pour. <laughs> exactly. No, that was uh, we uh, and we talked about this before, but at the Stratosphere, man, they had a bottle of that Nadura, and and John and I did a number on it. But um, uh, my brother in law's birthday was just this past week, and my sister calls me. She says, I want to get my uh, I want to get Mike some some whiskey or she just says bourbon 
And she's like, well, what should I get him? I was like, well, he's, he's a Scotch guy. Um, and I think last year she got him a bottle of Oban and he really liked it. Oh, yeah. And so I was, I was going through a couple of different things and I was like, well, okay, look for N- the Glenlivet Nadura. And she's like, well, they have Glenlivet 12, 15, 18. She was at the store when she called me. Uh, and they didn't have the Nadura, but I ended up turning, uh, turning her on to the, uh, Akintosh, uh, three wood yep. that we had. What was that last show, right? Last show. And that was the one that I loved. And I was really just excited that they had it. And I was like, oh, you got to ha- you have to get him that. And uh, he opened it up and he actually sent me a text message saying how much he loved it. He's like, dude, thank you so much for directing her towards this. Cause I never would have bought it cause he had never heard of it. And uh, my sister never would have bought it cause she doesn't know what's going on uh, when it comes to this stuff. But, uh, and even I really don't. So thank you. So I'm really extending the thank you that I got from my brother-in-law to you because otherwise I never would have known anything about the Akintosh three wood. I'm glad I could uh, make a great recommendation just before I sort of put this band aside. I just want to see if I can pick this up. It's a little bright tonight, but um, no, nah, it's I'll, not coming I, in. I'll show the band. You guys can see the band a little bit better on mine. Um, so you got the, you know, the dram number three cast number three, and then down there, that's really hard to read, but it, from the top down, it reads whiskey. You want to go with the spicy slash smoky whiskey. The profile of the cigar is spicy. The strength is medium plus. That's what it says, right? down there but you guys can't really see that but and i do i gotta go ahead i love that i love that i love the the marketing is just spot on well it's it, it kind of goes back to their website and we can keep talking about it it's it's a, a ton of information in a very small space yeah i mean if if you're just glancing at it as a band and you know you're maybe you don't even drink whiskey but you just happen to see this in your store it's an attractive band but there's a ton of information there you know that it's got a double, it's a double Habano. So they, he, we, they call it a double, double binder, but he said it's really kind of a double wrapper. Uh, so you know that it's got a double Habano in there, um, and you know the type of whiskeys. You know the profile of the cigar, the strength that you're going to get. I would like to see that really on more bands. Yeah. To be honest, I mean, when you talk about like you, you, age statements and things of that nature, you, you get those on wine always. So you know, like, oh, this was a good vintage or whatever. You're not going to get that from the cigars with the, the age statement of when the, uh, the, uh, the leaves were harvested and things like that. And I wouldn't expect that, but something along the lines of it gives you an idea of profile and an ideal of strength and you know what you can expect from the cigar. That's it's smart. And, and we've talked about it when we've done reviews and we've talked about it on the show. I think one of the things we really appreciate, and I think um, certainly this is true of the, uh, the fed heads out there is that a lot of people appreciate that information. So if you go to a website and you can find information about the blend, maybe a little bit more details about the background and the blending, uh, more details about what area it came from, you know, is it Jalapa? Um, is it Dominican? What area did it come from? What factor did it come from? And then, you, you know, you get like the, the beer companies, which, we've just gone on and on about they talk about suggested pairings or uh notes and we love that stuff we eat that stuff up and i think the fed heads out there really love that stuff and i think you know i get the sense that as the cigar market sort of matures that a lot of people really uh gravitate towards that, that information so you know i don't i don't know if it's necessarily a marketing thing but I think a lot of companies do themselves a great service by putting that on the website and allowing their, their uh, customers to read that and get more details about the product. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I had a really good point and I completely lost it. I, I was going to say something. Yeah. Uh, no, really. I, I was gonna, what was I going to say? I don't remember what I was going to say. Oh, you said Jalapa. And it's not a good point at all. It's actually just something I've been thinking about. Because he's excited to go to Nicaragua. Given the fact that four hours in, in, in a few days, I'm going to be blending my own cigar. It's going to be Jalapa heavy in my blend, assuming that I have those options. I, I'm I'm looking forward to that. It's I, um it's yeah. it's a hell of a trip, and uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm not going to be able to go, and obviously that guts me something fierce. Because um, I love Nicaragua, I love the people of Nicaragua, I love the cigar safari. Um, you know, I'm uh, hopefully I'll be there in spirit, but uh, you know, I'm really uh, I'm really gutted that I'm not going to be there. But I know you guys are going to have an absolute blast. And, uh, yeah, I'll I'll be channeling you. You know, of course, I'm gonna. I was thinking about bringing some <clears throat> some uh, some whiskey down with me, but I think I'll probably just pick it up at the airport because I remember they've got a spot uh, in the airport uh, there in Nicaragua that's got some some different things. And I'm actually kind of hoping that they might have some. And I don't know if they do. I, I, I remember there's a there's like a duty free in the Nicaraguan airport. And it's a small mm-hmm. airport, uh, but I don't remember if they had any um, 
Havana Club in there because I could actually buy that and bring it home now. Um, yeah, I don't remember either. I know that uh, every time I go into the duty free in Nicaragua, all I'm picking up and, and skip, uh, skip is the Florida Kanye. <laughs> is the Florida Kanye pour. And, uh, man, every time I go in there, it's like, yep, give me two bottles of Florida Kanye 18 and those bottles, one bottle is for like the first night. I'm going to drain that puppy. And the second bottle is like for, you know, night two or night three. Um, cause the, you know, I love the beer is pretty good, but, um, you know, when I really want to get my, my show on, uh, I got to, I got to pour that Florida Canyon, uh, man. It is easy to drain two bottles of Florida Canyon. I love that stuff. No, I'm, I'm definitely picking up a couple of bottles just to bring and share with the fed heads who are down there on this trip. And then, uh, on the way home, I'm hoping that I, I don't remember if there's a Havana club there, but I, I wouldn't have been able to take it home back then. Anyway, this was a couple of years ago, but I could actually bring it home now. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that, uh, that there might be some there that I can, uh, that I can take home. That'd be nice. Well, if the uh, stars align and I'm able to go back to Cuba in November, which is kind of up in the air right now with my circumstances, but if I'm able to go back, I'm probably going to bring back something uh, extra special with me this time, because um, the Havana Club is it's 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 good, um, but the uh, the Maximo, um, and they've got a couple other um, aged rums there. Uh, which are phenomenal. I'm definitely going to bring some of those back and uh, hopefully get some samples out for future rum shows. Uh, but just a reminder to our audience that you're listening to Sharing Our Pairings, episode 29. We're sponsored by Dram Cigars. Tonight we're smoking Dram Cask number three. We had Joe on the show earlier. If you missed it, go back, check it out. Cool guy. Uh, talking a little bit about the cigars, talking a little bit about the uh, what's coming in the future. And, uh, you know, we're drinking, uh, we're drinking some whiskey, uh, with some American whiskey or Scottish whiskey or, or Indian whiskey. Uh, we've got a little bit, a little bit of everything tonight. Yeah, no, this has been fun. I, I, uh, I'll admit, uh, I wasn't really looking forward to, um, the cigar and I've said it before in, earlier in the show. And I said it when Joe was here because I, I want to be honest with everybody. And if you know my, you guys know where, where my tastes tend to, uh, gravitate towards in cigars. Creamy. And this is really yeah, and it's not always that, but it's, you know, I, I big pepper bombs are really not my forte. They were when I started, um, you know, smoking the diesels and the, and the things of that nature because that was what I was, uh, you know, what I really knew about. And those are still still good cigars. I'll still fire up a, a diesel unholy cocktail. That's a really good cigar. Uh, oh, yeah. or, the, or the diesel shorty. I like that one too. One of the few 60 ring gauge cigars that I like. Um, but I haven't really done that lately and I haven't. I, I, to be honest, I haven't smoked much lately. I've been at the ballpark a lot. I've been, you know, fighting deadlines a lot, but you know, the last few days I'm, I'm trying to, trying to get myself ready for, uh, Nicaragua when it's going to be rolling out of bed and firing up a T-52 for breakfast, you know, which is not really normally what I do, but, uh, um, this, this cigar, it, it, it impressed me. Um, it, more so than the number two. I mean, the number two was good. It wasn't great for me. The number one was great. I really liked the number one. The number one, I would pick up a box and have that in there. And I would smoke them on their own. I would smoke them with like a nice cream coffee. I would smoke them with, you know, some Glen Morangy and the things that we were tasting in the, at the beginning. I mean, you could even fire it up with some, just some regular old Johnny Walker black yep. uh, or Johnny Walker red, even with that uh, and enjoy it, you know, but uh, this one, this one snuck up on me and it really did impress me. I'm just going to take a question here um, from Harley Holmes. He has a good question. I appreciate you guys just posting questions. Uh, I'm going to try and get the, the next show for uh, Dram Cask number four. And our future shows up uh, well in advance, probably this week, because I've got lots of time on my hands. Uh, podcast audience out there, we know you guys are out there in droves. Uh, if you wouldn't mind going to Google Plus to the show page, use the Q&A app. Uh, we'd love to hear from you guys, get some questions in. We'd love to answer them. Harley asks, how much of a difference does a sherry cask make in the flavor versus a regular oak cask? And maybe, Rob, you want to touch on this a little bit because we've talked about this. Um, what do you think? What do you, like this, the Spanish casks that you've had tonight, how much of a difference does it make? Well, it's, it's tough to say that in comparison to what I've had tonight because they both were sherry casks, if I understand correctly. Well, he um, wants to know uh, sherry cask versus just a regular oak cask, like maybe a bourbon indeed, cask. Indeed, indeed. Um, so with what, the, with, the whiskeys that I had tonight, there's that that fruitiness to it, and we we talked about it. You can call it cherry, you can call it kind of a jammy note, um, like a cherry preserves is what uh, John, what you were mentioning before, and that's that's something that is, is in many of the whiskeys that I really enjoy. And I've gone back, and in my head, I'm kind of going back over some of the stuff that I really like. That's not smoky. That's not uh, you know just a regular bourbon. 
it's got just a, an extra fruitiness to it that is really nice, and it's a sweetness in there. And I love sweet. If Again, if you know me and my cigars, me and everything, and there, if there's a sweetness in there, I'm into it for the most part. Um, and there's that nice sweetness that's there that I really do enjoy. And on that, it's that finish too. It, it, it's crisp. It's clean. It doesn't linger too much in a way that it's, uh, that, that, you know, I, I like a finish to linger a little bit, but I don't want it to linger too much. And it, it kind of does, it does almost everything that I want out of a whiskey and everything that I, that I enjoy tends to be a sherry cask. And I, this is a, a new revelation for me, uh, within the, <laughs> within the last hour, <laughs> uh, to really realize that that's, that's that flavor. There's a flavor that when I taste it, I know I like it, but I don't necessarily know where it comes from. And it was the same way with cigars. I mean, there's certain things that I like. And as you go through this journey, you kind of realize, oh, well, that's what I like. So now when I see something that's in the store that's, you know, I'm kind of debating between this, that, and the other, and there's a sherry cask. Well, I'm going to go lean towards that sherry cask because it's got that sweetness. It's got a little bit of that cherry note to it that I really do enjoy. I don't know if that answers the question, but I'm rambling. It, it does. And, uh, you know, maybe just go into some more nerdy detail for Harley and, and our audience out there. Uh, cask is all the difference in the world. The only other thing that's really going to change the flavor as much as the cask is whether that barley is peated or not. So if you just take a regular unpeated barley and you say, okay, well, what's, you know, other than the spirit, which, you know, the spirit does change depending on the type of still because the, the, the uh, design of the still and the arm of the still really uh, imparts the, the type of spirit you're producing. But that's, um, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's really minor compared to the type of cask you're using. So if you're using a bourbon cask, just a straight old bourbon cask, a first fill uh, bourbon cask, not a second or third fill, you're going to get vanilla, you're going to get, um, you know, fresh fruits like strawberry, um, raspberry. It's going to be very light, very delicate, vanilla. It's going to be good. With a sherry cask, you're going to get big, big uh, fruity bomb. You're going to get, um, you're going to get some uh, tropical fruits. You're going to get some pepper. You're going to get some spice. You're going to get some jammy notes. Um, so the cask is everything. And uh, whether it's a, a regular oak cask, a white oak cask, an ex bourbon cask, a sherry cask, or even the, uh, the case of the Glen Levitt Nadura, which we were talking about, which is a, an ex wine cask, um, which is kind of becoming a thing in the industry. There's some wine casks or the Akintosh and three, Wood, which we talked about, which was three different kinds of, uh, of uh, sherry casks, makes all the difference in the world. So if you want something a little bit different in your whiskey, uh, look to see what kind of cask they're using because that's going to really impart the, the true character of that whiskey. It's going to start out as one thing and depending on the type of uh, cask that they're using, it's going to end up something completely different. You know, it's funny, <clears throat> while you were doing that, while you were talking, and you always have better points to make than I do. Uh, which is, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Um, I, I'm, I'm going back and I'm looking up some of the the uh, whiskeys that I like. And Glenmorangie Lasanta, 12-year-old sherry cask, matured. It's a lot of the stuff that I like really does go back to that sherry cask. It's funny, man. I never realized it. It's not something I ever paid attention to. But the, the Lasanta is one of my favorite that I've ever had. And it's not an expensive whiskey. And I'm sure there's there's whiskeys out there that are that are better and, you know, whatever. But that's one that I picked up just kind of on a whim. I went through like the entire bottle during a Christmas season and I picked up another bottle and went through that and I'm ready to buy another one. But uh, it's there's that 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 flavor that I get from that sherry cask is really what what draws me in. I, I'm, I'm really glad that I, I we've come to that realization. I'm <laughs> yeah, excited. Well, yeah, well, what's going to be really interesting, I think, for uh, Dramcast number four, which I'm not sure which episode that's going to be, um, you know, looking in the future, it's going to be at least a couple of weeks. Um, but the uh, I think the samples I sent you for uh, for number four is going to be the uh, Lafroy uh, three wood, triple wood, pardon me, and the Lafroy core cask. And that's going to be a really interesting contrast because you've got uh, a whiskey from the same distillery finished either uh, just a one cask, which is just a peated, bar peated barley uh, and then finished in a one, I think it's ex-bourbon. And then the, the triple wood, which is a different, different altogether. And you're going to find a whole different character between the two whiskeys, even though they're from the same distillery, that cask is going to play such a part in the, uh, in the final product. It's going to be really interesting to see how those play off against each other and then how they play off against uh, drum cask number three or drum, yeah. number, drum cask number four, pardon me. Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, that show is, uh, <clears throat> that's going to be sometime in the future. We're going to get those samples. Um, I, I think that, uh, 
we're going to get those samples on the way relatively soon. Um, so we'll, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. What is our next show? So uh, we got a ton of stuff coming up in the future. Our next uh, true sharing our pairings is going to be all the way in the future to uh, May the 27th, which is our normal time slot of Wednesday. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, Sodi Pop 2.0 because I know we've had a lot of people. Um, and just before I finish that statement, Harley was asking in the chat room, is cask the same as a barrel? Yes, it is. Um, cask and barrel mean the same thing. Um, when you refer to uh, a cask, um, they're, they're, uh, barrel is barrel is really a, a more precise descriptor of a small cask, but a cask is a very large vessel containing many hundreds of liters. Um, but going back to what I was just talking about, uh, sharing our pairings episode 30, we're going to go back to uh, Soda Pop 2.0 because it's been a long time since we've done uh, Soda Pop and we really enjoyed the uh, first show we did. We've had a lot of people ask because we have a lot of our audience who aren't necessarily drinkers or maybe just don't uh, enjoy pairing cigars with with liquor and you know power to you um so we're going to do uh soda pop 2.0 we're going to kick it up a little bit um maybe get some uh, pairings uh probably not ginger beer i think this time or uh ginger ale no ginger ale, that one was rough man that was rough <laughs> uh but we might come up with some really interesting stuff um we might go back to uh four four drinks who knows we're, we're gonna you know we can do anything on the show but that's gonna be on may the 27th coming up this week and i, I really uh urge you guys to pay attention uh cigar chat's gonna be live from esteli this thursday from uh 8 p.m eastern standard to 9 p.m eastern standard so that's gonna be broadcast uh, live from esteli presuming the uh, wi-fi holds out and i think it will because it's improved um and then uh uh, Stogie Geeks is going to have an episode the same night, episode 140. Um, and then, because uh, you guys are a hardworking bunch, you're going to get off a plane from Esteli, go right at it Monday, May 18th with uh, Moya Ria's Cigars on Monday. So we're uh, we're packed tight on uh, on shows here. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're hoping that we can do Cigar Chat on Thursday. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, we won't have like a, a specific guest as we usually do. Uh, it would just kind of be Logan and I, and then we'll have some of the fed heads who are there. Maybe we'll get shooter to jump on and, and, and chat with us for a little bit and uh, trip and, Ann and some of those other guys who are going to be there. Um, <clears throat> you know, maybe JD will pop in and say, hello, who knows? Oh, I suspect JD will probably pop in. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is our pretty good likelihood. We'll see I, what the plan is to keep everybody kind of updated as, uh, as the week progresses um and let folks know well it might be pushed back or it might be pushed up because the time slot might fluctuate but depending on uh where they have us and what we're going to be doing at that particular time but the plan is to do a show uh live from Esteli, and that will be that'll be a ton of fun and uh from what i understand this is going to be uh this is going to be an annual trip so uh next year hopefully we'll get john in there and, and uh and we can get uh, you know more of you guys to come out and, and enjoy the trip. I know Charlie's talking about he's he's upset that he can't be there this year. Hopefully next year, and uh, Jared Grillet and guys like that who are uh, really active on the site. Hopefully we can get them to come out uh, next year as well. So I'm excited. Um, I'm I didn't sleep very well last night, so hopefully I can sleep on the plane. And uh, yeah, we'll be checking in with you guys from there. And yeah, like you said, Monday we're, we're off the plane on Saturday. Monday we're going to be doing. Uh, another show with uh, Moya Ruiz uh, with The Rake, their new release. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, to get that going for you guys as well. And uh, make sure to tune in next Wednesday as a, you get a real pipe dummy on the show. I'm going to be uh, trying to fill some pretty big shoes on uh, pipe dummies with bats and pipes on May the 20th. Uh, Rob, I think you have a, a, a awesome game that night. So I'll be stepping in, trying to be the best dummy that I can. So uh, we get a lot of shows. I hope you guys all tune in for those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll be at the ballpark, so I'll be uh, I'll be channeling you in in uh, maybe I'll pepper you with some questions, but yeah. not like I not like I can answer them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, make sure to check out Dram Cigars, DramCigars.com, and uh, check out your local B and M. Or if you can't, check out online because they're available everywhere. Thanks very much, everyone, for tuning in, and uh, really appreciate you guys trying to get in some questions for our future shows in the Q and A app. Make sure to drink better and drink less. <laughs> <laughs>